Okay, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you once again, and I hope you're ready to dive more into some of these wonderful, refreshing wells in the Word of God. And so I'd like you, if you would, if you've got your Bibles there, turn to Isaiah chapter 12, Isaiah chapter 12. And uh, it's a, not a long chapter, just six verses, uh, but a very beautiful chapter. And it once again takes us into this topic of wells. And so beginning in verse one of Isaiah chapter 12, it says, in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, and make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. And again, God will bless that short reading from his precious word to us this evening. This chapter is what's known as a song of redemption. It's the climax of a section, a section that actually begins in chapter 7. And maybe we'll go back to chapter 7 and just look at it and just get the background to this climax redemption song. Uh, that we just read in chapter 12. And so in chapter 7, uh, we learn that these were prophecies given by Isaiah the prophet in the days of King Ahaz. And so notice it says in verse 1, it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And so that's the background. Prophecies during the reign of King Ahaz, when Judah, the nation, tiny nation of Judah, was under threat from a confederacy uh, that had been uh, made between the nation of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, and Syria. And in this chapter, God promises them deliverance. Uh, he tells them, uh, down in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. In other words, uh, this confederacy that is against you, that is seeking to destroy you, is not going to succeed because God was going to deliver them. And then it's kind of an interesting thing that these Old Testament prophets, um, oftentimes they talked about events that were present but they would intersperse the, the present event they were talking about and then kind of project it down, as it were, the road a while and have future events in view as well. And so uh, in chapter 7, of course, we're all very familiar with Isaiah chapter 7 because there's a, a very important verse in chapter 7 of Isaiah uh, that we know and know well. Verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which, of course, we know means God with us. And so the idea is this, that God is going to deliver his people. In the short term, he's going to deliver them from this confederacy. But in the long term, there's a coming day when there'll be another confederacy of nations. In fact, it says all the nations will come and surround the nation of Israel in the last days, and the Lord will deliver them. And who will be the deliverer? It will be Emmanuel, God with us. It'll be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who will deliver Israel in a coming day. But in this case, as a result of deliverance that is promised to them, uh, it climaxes with this song of redemption, a song of celebration, uh, just as the original redemption song, if we go back to the book of Exodus, 
uh, will notice that the first song that's recorded that we uh, have in scripture was a, a, a song of redemption after they'd been uh, delivered from Egypt and their enemies uh, that had come against them. Remember, Pharaoh and all his chariots had been destroyed. When we get to chapter 15, we get this amazing redemption song. And it says, verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song to the Lord, and spake, saying, I'll sing to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he is become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. Uh, I'll prepare him an habitation, my God's, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. What's interesting is that in this particular first praise song in Exodus 15, there's a little statement in verse two, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. And when we look at Isaiah chapter 12, uh, we'll see that very same concept that the Lord has become my salvation. He is my strength. He has become my salvation. Look at verse 2 of Isaiah 12. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. That's a direct quotation, really, from Exodus 15, verse 2. So it's a song of redemption. But what's interesting is that, again, there's a near fulfillment in the sense of God delivering them from this present confederacy. But there's also a far fulfillment when Israel are going to really sing this song. And I believe that they're going to sing it at the beginning of the millennial kingdom after their time of great tribulation is over. You say, well, this time of Jacob's trouble. How, how do we know that? Well, it's kind of interesting that in chapter 11 of Isaiah, we have a great description of the millennial kingdom, don't we? Uh, we, we, we read uh, marvelous uh, things like verse uh, 6, where it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Yeah, and then it goes on and, and talks about uh, verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So it's a description of the millennial reign. And who is the one going to reign? Well, chapter 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and so on and so forth. So what we can say is, actually, it's when Emmanuel, God with us, comes to reign over his people, that there'll be a time of unprecedented blessing on this earth right? It's going to be a marvelous time and all the wars and all the stuff that's been going on and things that make this world a barren wilderness in our present, no more school shootings, no more, uh, all this stuff is going, it's going to come to an end. There's going to be a time of unprecedented blessing, a righteous government, a perfectly righteous king reigning in righteousness for a thousand years. It's going to be an amazing, and the, and the earth will experience uh, it's Sabbath rest. In fact, it says in verse 10, in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people uh, to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. It'll be a time of glorious Sabbath rest for the earth. And so great time. And as a result of that, Israel, who will be converted at the second coming of Christ, will burst into song. And this will be their song of redemption in chapter 12. This is going to be that song that they sing in those millennial days when their troubles are over and when they're experiencing the long promised blessing uh, that Messiah uh, has brought with him. So this remnant of Israel that have uh, experienced deliverance. They, they've come through the tribulation. They're coming into the restoration uh, of the land into the millennial days, and they are going to praise. And so it's going to be a wonderful time. You see, in Exodus 15, 
remember when they praised the Lord because he delivered them from Egypt, as soon as they got into the wilderness, it wasn't too many days before they were complaining at the waters of Mara and they were saying the waters were bitter, right? It was short-lived. They, they, they sang one minute and then they're bitterly complaining in a short time afterwards. But when they sing this song in Isaiah chapter 12, this song shall never cease. Throughout that thousand years, it will never be disturbed. They will enjoy unprecedented peace, enjoy in harmony, and there'll be no bitter waters left to drink. It's just going to be sweet waters that are going to come out of the wells of salvation. So it's going to be a tremendous, tremendous time. But although the, the primary interpretation, and again, we want to draw a distinction between primary interpretation and then practical application. And so certainly the primary uh, interpretation of this song is the song of redemption for Israel. But for those of us in this church age, there's a certain sense in which we've already tasted the powers of the age to come. I often, I, I love that scripture in Hebrews chapter six. Maybe we'll just turn there for a second. Hebrews six, and it, it just simply says this, speaking of the, uh, the, the Hebrew Christians, and, and he said, that, <clears throat> It's impossible for those, verse 4, who are once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and notice this, and the powers of the world to come, or the powers of the age to come. And what it's telling us is, actually, that when we got saved, we already got a taste of the age to come. Uh, the age to come is going to be a time of peace on planet earth, but we already have peace ourselves the minute we were saved, right? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've already entered in, in a sense, in a measure, we've tasted something of what that glorious age is going to be like. And, and it's a wonderful thing. And by the way, I do believe that when there is revival, and it's one of my favorite topics, because I'm praying for revival, because uh, it'll, it'll be a very different scene than it is now. But during times of revival, Christians have always said it seemed like the Lord had come down and it seemed like his knowledge was everywhere. It, it just seems like, and, and what was it? Well, it's, it's a little taste. It's tasting the powers of the age to come. Whenever we experience spiritual revival, it's giving us a little glimpse about what that coming millennial age is going to be like. And we're just getting a taster. And it's wonderful. And, and you read of uh, these times, I, I've read of counts of revival in places like Scotland, where, where all the bars shut down, where the jails were empty, where the policemen had nothing to do, where crime was unheard of, and, and where people were singing psalms and praising God day and night. And it just, uh, it was an amazing time. The whole community was transformed. And what had happened? Well, they were tasting the powers of the age to come, and they were loving it. And that's why we need to pray for that, because right now we're not enjoying that much in our current scene. Uh, we're seeing wickedness on every part. We're reminded of it even this evening. So we want to certainly see application uh, in, a, in a practical way to the church that we can experience this in a measure, tasting the powers because we have drawn water from the wells of salvation. Uh, we know the Holy One of Israel in the midst of us, right? Every time we gather, what do we say? Where two or three are gathered, there is he, he in the midst, and he's the Holy One of Israel. He's already in the midst now. He's going to be in the midst of them in this millennial day, but we've already experienced some of that and enjoying it uh, immensely. And, and so certainly there's practical application for us. Now, when we look at chapter 12, having kind of laid the background and the scene, it really divides into two sections, and it's pretty easy to see. Uh, verses one through three, uh, it begins with, and in that day thou shalt say. And if you notice verse four through six, it says, and in that day shall ye say. So obviously, there's a, there's a, a break there. There's kind of two sections, both beginning with, and in that day. And both sections continue with praise, but there's, a, there's a, a, a different emphasis. And one of the reasons that I do enjoy the King James Bible, 
is because it does differentiate uh, quite often between singular and plural, where, where modern English translations can't do that. And so it says, in that day thou shalt say, in other words, it's speaking singular. Okay, that phrase thou, or thee and thine, is all singular, whereas ye is plural. <clears throat> and so notice verse 4, it says, and in that day shall ye say. That's plural. So the first section, verses 1 through 3, is individual. And then the second section, 4 through 6, is plural. It's speaking of all, ye, all of the children of Israel. Okay, so singular versus plural. And certainly we'll be able to see why that is the case. Because in verses 1 through 3, I believe that the nation of Israel is personified as one man. It, it's kind of, it, it's, the nation is pictured like a man, a single man suffering under God's wrath because of his rebellion against God. And so notice verse 1, in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me thine anger is turned away. So the idea is that the nation is personified as one man who God is angry with that man because of his sin or has been in the past. And of course, um, you know, Psalm 711 says, God is angry with the wicked every single day. And when Israel were involved in great wickedness, the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. So you were angry with me. And let me just show uh, clearly that this is the idea that it's kind of seeing it as a person rather than uh, just each individual. But corporately, the nation was seen as one individual uh, who were under the judgment of God. Look back to chapter one of Isaiah, chapter one of Isaiah, and we'll look, notice verse five and six. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And so what he's picturing is a sick man, right? From the bottom of his feet to the top of his head, he is absolutely sick. And then the next verse says, your country is desolate. So clearly, he's using this idea of personifying Israel or the nation of Judah as one man, but he's saying you're sick. You're really sick from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. And that was their condition. And because they were so sick spiritually, God was angry with them. And because uh, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so in his anger, he chastened Israel, and they went through a time of tremendous chastening and of course that chastening is still ongoing and it's going to reach a massive climax isn't it in the the the, the day uh, of jacob's trouble in the tribulation period uh, god's dealing with that nation chastising them and so we're, we're, we're given this picture in this first section of god's his anger with them is now past and comfort is coming but he's picturing them that way as uh, once so totally uh, involved with sin that 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 the, the body was just kind of described as full of sin that's how the nation was but then the second section it it moves from the singular to the the plural and it's like every person in the nation will rejoice and praise god and glorify him for his mercy to them in the second section so notice uh, again, verse one, it says, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. So how could Jehovah's anger be turned away finally from Israel? And the reason is that it was taken out on someone else. We talked about Emmanuel, God with us. And later on in the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to read, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've each turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so the, the anger of the Lord, the Lord's anger against 
sin would be poured out on a substitute in their place in in the one who is that suffering servant and they would experience comfort his anger turned away thou comfortest me i'd like you to look for he's just for a second at isaiah chapter 40 where we get this kind of parallel idea and again it's to do with the lord jesus coming to bring comfort to the nation that have suffered so much because of their sin isaiah 40 verse 1 comfort ye Comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for her sins. And so again, Israel will one day be receive the comfort of God because the chastisement will be over and they will experience his blessing and his comfort. And, of course, that is referring to the coming kingdom age, when the day of Jacob's trouble is over, when they have looked on him whom they have pierced, and they mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. I'd like you just to look. Please just keep your finger in Isaiah 11, but look with me at Zechariah, where you'll see the day when this will happen. After the tribulation is... Uh, come to a climax, if you like. Look at verse 9. It shall come to pass in that day. Uh, this is Zechariah 12, verse 9. And if you have a hard time finding Zechariah, look at Matthew and start working backwards, and you'll be there very quickly. You're going backwards, you got Matthew, Malachi, and then Zechariah. Zechariah 12, verse 9. In, in, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And when the Lord Jesus comes back to deliver Israel from all their enemies, they're surrounded by enemies. The final solution is in sight, their destruction of the Jewish people and a deliverer will come out of Zion riding on a white horse. will be the Lord Jesus. And they'll look, it says, upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn. They'll realize that awful realization will dawn upon them. We have crucified our own Messiah. And there'll be massive mourning. Instead of rejoicing that they've just been delivered, you know, you'd think they'd be dancing in the streets. You know, they were about to be wiped out. And, and now a deliverer has come, but he's the last person they expected to come to their aid was the one who they called the apostate and despised and rejected. And here he is coming. And it says there'll be mourning throughout the land. And, of course, it talks about every family mourning and every family apart. And the idea is that everybody will want to get alone and everybody will be just devastated. They'll be just brokenhearted. What have we done in crucifying our own Messiah? But then chapter 13, verse 1, it says, In that day there shall be a fountain, fountain opened to the house of David, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness see a well will be open to them a fountain <laughs> but it's a fountain filled with blood drawn from emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stains and so a nation will be born again in one day all israel shall be saved they'll look on him whom they fear so they'll mourn for him and so it'll be a glorious glorious day and they'll they'll enter into a time of comfort and they'll acknowledge in verse two uh, a marvelous marvelous verse and, and you know the tragedy is I, I have to say this before i go on to verse two is that when jesus was on earth they had an opportunity to drink of that life-giving water remember John chapter 7, and the Lord Jesus says to them, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. As the scripture said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water, this spake of the spirit uh, that <clears throat> would be given when people believed on the Lord Jesus. You say, come to me. But they refused. They said, we will not have this man. Some did. Praise God. Some, some did. And they experienced that powers of the age to come but some did not and they rejected him the majority 
by the way, on a practical level, we said that there's a personal application to this, but wasn't it wonderful when we sensed God's anger against us as unbelievers? You know, we were under conviction of sin. We knew we deserved to go to hell. We knew that God would be perfectly righteous to send us to hell because of our sin. And then somehow we looked by faith at the uplifted Savior. And instead of feeling his anger, we felt his comfort. He loved me. He gave himself for me. And we, we, we entered into that joy uh, ourselves and had our song, right? He brought us out of a miry pit, put our feet on a rock, put a new song in our hearts, even praise to our God. And, and we had our song of redemption, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the lamb. You know, so we, we've been there. We've experienced that. But Israel will experience it in a marvelous way in this coming day. And so they acknowledge in verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. Only God could save them. Only God could save us. I will trust and not be afraid. But the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. See, the Lord Jesus is the one who dug the well. He's, he's the, I mean, of course, the, the work of digging the well, the opening the wells of salvation. Well, that well that he dug, the work is hard. It's sweaty work. It's hard work. And even in the process of digging that well and opening up to us so that we might have that living water, he cried himself, I thirst. Oh, how agonizing that work was that he went through to make it possible for us to come and drink. And of course, how do we, how do we drink? How do we, well, of course, faith is the instrument that draws out the water, isn't it? Faith in him, in his finished work allows that stream to flow so that we can get refreshment from the well of salvation. So he says, and, and of this is a, a refrain that we've already seen, uh, this idea of uh, he also has become my salvation. We saw it in Exodus 15 and verse 2. We also see it in a, in a marvelous psalm. And I want you just to look at Psalm 118 and if you have a ribbon or a Bible marker, you might want to stick it in there because we'll come back to Psalm 118 in a moment. Um, but Psalm 118 and verse 14, where we read these words, the Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. There it is again. The Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. That's, again, exactly what it says in Isaiah 12, verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I'll trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. So, again, just a refrain that runs through this, these praise psalms, as well as that great song in Exodus 15 and here in Isaiah 12 and verse 2. So who has become Israel's salvation? Well, it's Jehovah, Shua. Jehovah is salvation. That's the idea, Jehovah, Shua. And, of course, when you have Jehovah, Shua, Jehovah is salvation. Uh, if that name was shortened, it would be shortened to Joshua. And Joshua is the Hebrew word for Jesus. And is it going to be amazing that in that coming day that the nation of Israel will acknowledge God is my salvation, but who is this God? Well, actually, this God is the Lord Jehovah, Lord Jesus, is my strength. He is my song. He has also become my salvation. What a glorious day that will be to hear from people who, who it would, it would, they, they would almost choke rather than say that now. But in a coming day, they'll say it, and they'll say it with joy and passion. And then it says, <clears throat> in this very same verse, I will trust and not be afraid. And that's the language of a true believer, isn't it? I will trust and not be afraid. Isn't it amazing that for, for a child of God, we can know incredible peace, even in troubled times, because we trust and we're not afraid. We trust in the one. He's taking care of our eternal future. He can take care of me now. I will trust and not be afraid. This is the language of the child of God. Even in our COVID uh, 
monkeypox, war, torn world. It doesn't matter. It, he is the one who we can trust in. And we're not afraid. Fear not, for I am with thee. We have the Lord with us. So he says, therefore, because he is, the Lord is our salvation, with joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. It's kind of it, very interesting how this all begins. Go back to Isaiah chapter 7 again. I want you just to notice that in verse 3, it says, Then said the Lord to Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now, why do you think Ahaz was at the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field? Well, part of it was that there's a confederacy coming against Israel. And one of the things you want to do is you want to block up the, the wells, the water supply, so the enemy can't get water. And so he's trying to manipulate defense by dealing with the water supply. Uh, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to stop uh, it in order to hinder the invader and to, and, and to stop the, the threat uh, that is coming against him. So he's supervising that and, and overseeing that. And, and yet <clears throat> the Lord would tell him that they, he would deliver them. They won't, don't need all those schemes of men. He'll deliver them. And then he says, you will with joy draw water out of the wells of salvation because living water refreshment for weary souls in a wilderness land you draw water from the wells of salvation now again we've, we've used this picture but i want you just to see how frequently the word of god has this idea of living water uh, coming from the the well and how it satisfies the well that satisfies look at Isaiah 55, verse 1, for a moment. O everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And so, again, just he's coming, offering satisfaction. Uh, for that water is being offered. Uh, notice Psalm 42. Just the number of times it talks about the, the, the satisfying of this living water in scripture. Isaiah 40, uh, sorry, Psalm 42, verse 1, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. This, this thirsting after God. And then, of course, the one that we're going to be visiting next week, Lord willing, uh, another well story in John's Gospel, chapter 4. By now, well, Scott is an expert on, I believe, but uh, anyway, John's Gospel, chapter 4 and verse 13 and 14, where the Lord says to this very thirsty woman, she's been looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. And Jesus answered and said unto her, whoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And then if I could just do one more and ask you to turn to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Right at the end of the, the Bible, the very last chapter, verse 17, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come. And then it says this, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Isn't that beautiful? Whoever will, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely and so this picture is just over and over again in the word of god now what's interesting to me is do you remember when the lord jesus said is anybody thirsty let him come to me and drink well here's the little bit of the background i want to kind of take in that background just for a moment during the feast of tabernacles which is the context of jesus saying if anyone thirsts. In fact, it was the last day. It was the eighth day, the great day of the feast. So it was a seven-day festival, and then they had a holy day on the eighth day. So they've had seven days, and in those first seven days, 
during the Feast of Tabernacles, a priest drew an urn of water from the pool of Siloam. And he carried it through the, the water gate, as you would imagine. So he gets the water at the pool of Siloam, carries it through the water gate, uh, while the people recite, recited Isaiah 12, verse 3. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. So they would actually quote this. And then once inside the city, they paraded the urn of water to the altar, accompanied by a choir singing Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. That's called the Great Halal. And they would sing those as uh, this ritual was going on. And then the priest would pour the water on the altar as an offering to God. But on the great day of the feast, they marched seven times around the altar before pouring the water. And so <clears throat> they made a real big deal of it. And of course, the whole time they're singing, but at the climax, when, when the water is about to be poured, they, they actually are singing from Psalm 118, and we, we know the very spot they're singing from. It's from verse 19 to verse 29. That's why I asked you to keep your ribbon there. I want to read it to you. It says this, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. The gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I'll praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. I will give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And isn't it interesting that while they're going through all this ritual, they're actually reciting the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. <laughs> and yet the Lord Jesus, after all that ceremony, after a week of religion, he says to them, he stands up on that great day of the feast, and he says, is anybody thirsty? You've had all this ritual, you've had all this religion, is there anybody thirsty? He said, if you're really thirsty, let him come to me. <laughs> you see, I'm the one that can give you that water welling up so much so that, that actually it will come out from you like rivers of living water. I can really satisfy you. Religion can never do that. And so it's Christ is the one who is in view here. Whoever drinks of this water <clears throat> will thirst again. The world's religion, uh, the world's materialism, the world's hedonism, it, it never satisfies. They'll, they'll keep going back for more because it never satisfies. But he says, I'm going to give you that which satisfies. And so it tells us in verse 4, as they move from dealt with as God dealing with them as an individual it says in that day shall you say praise the Lord call upon his name declare his doings among the people make mention that his name is exalted and so so now they're going to be giving testimony to others they're going to be telling everybody what what the Lord has done for them Israel uh, redeemed and wanting to speak of the one that for, for centuries they were forbidden to even mention. And they want to speak about him. Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Uh, and of course, amongst the people, uh, amongst the nations, reach out to all the nations. We're reminded again of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he, he tells us that if the fall of them in Romans eleven twelve Israel be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them but life from the dead? And so I believe that what's going to happen is the nation of Israel are going to just tell everybody how marvelous the Lord Jesus is. They're going to go at great lengths to let everybody know how marvelous he is. 
They're going to praise his, the Lord, call on his name, declare his doings, sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. And this is known in all the earth. You see, all the earth has to know this. They, they're not content just to keep it to themselves anymore. They're not going to be that exclusive club. They want everybody to know how marvelous the Lord Jesus is. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. And of course, just like the book of Ezekiel, at the very end, it says, Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. And in the millennial kingdom, the Lord will literally be there in the midst of Israel, in Jerusalem, be reigning from there. And he'll be the Holy One of Israel in the midst of them. And they will be so delighted. And yet, what about us? We have been redeemed at such great price. We've been given that fount of living water. And, and is it true of us that out of our innermost being flows rivers of living water? Do we want to tell everyone about the greatness of the Lord Jesus, how wonderful he is? Are we wanting to spread abroad the victor's fame? We should. We should have that overflowing life, right? He's done so much. He was angry with us, but he's turned it away because the Lord Jesus took our sin in his own body on that tree. And when we meet together, how wonderful to be reminded that that Holy One of Israel is in the midst of us, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And so by way of final application, because our time is just about gone, isn't it a joyful thing for us to recall the wonders of our salvation? And if we were to draw waters out of the wells of salvation, we could, we could bring out all the marvelous aspects of our salvation and think about them, and it will bring great joy to us. We'll think about the substitutionary atonement and the price that was paid for our redemption. We think about regeneration, how we, we've been born from above. We're new creatures in Christ. That's a great thing out of the wells of salvation. Think about redemption, the price that bought us out of the slave market of sin, never to put us up for sale again. We think of justification, that we're declared righteous because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Propitiation, God is satisfied with the work of his son. Nothing to add to it, nothing whatsoever. It's all perfectly accepted. And then adoption, that we're treated not as babes, but as adult mature sons. And sanctification, that he set us apart for himself now, and then glorification. One day, one day we'll see him and we'll be like him and we'll see him as he is. Is there a lot of things that could bring joy to your heart if you would meditate on those great truths? Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. May God encourage us to go to the wells <laughs> and drink deeply of that living water and not just drink it, but that it would well up within us and then overflow his glory reaching out to others through us. May God encourage us with these things. Our Father, we're so thankful for thy precious word, the consistency of it, the, uh, the order of it, the, the marvelous uh, way it fits together. Lord, we're just so blessed, and we're thankful for the Lord Jesus, the, the glorious Savior, uh, the one who loved us at our very worst, the one who went to Calvary and, as it were, dug that well, at great cost to himself, so that we might indeed drink of this living water. Oh, what a marvelous Savior. We thank you for him. We praise his glorious name this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.